heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Live from London and San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, close your eyes and buy. My Muddy Waters founder, Carson Block, is bullish on big tech. Plus, the future of Disney's kingdom, details on the company's new leadership moves and CEO succession plans. Plus, we'll hear from the Taiwanese premier on the country's thriving chip business. But first, quick check on these markets, which are perhaps taking a slight pause ahead of some big weeks. I focus in on crypto, Ed. We're down by more than 2% there. We've actually seen more than 2 billion flow into ETFs, of course, that buy spot Bitcoin, for example. We were near $70,000. We're just pulling back slightly as risk sentiment changes ahead of all-important earnings week, all-important election in the next coming two weeks. But we focus in on crypto just as, to show us what risk sentiment's really showing us today. But you're looking at the micros. Yeah, there's a few tech stocks that we're following throughout the show. Disney has named former Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman as its new chair of the board and promising to name a new CEO early 2026. We'll bring you the details. Microsoft has some new AI agents. It's taking on Salesforce. We go to our correspondent on that. And look at the U.S. listed shares of Taiwan Semiconductor actually continuing to gain momentum. We have a very important interview with Taiwan's premier where we talk about the golden jewel of their industry, but also some of their energy needs, the broader context of what's happening in semiconductors for that nation. You don't want to miss it halfway through the program. Cara? We don't. Meanwhile, we return to the macro picture because earlier today, Muddy Waters Capital founder Carson Block joined Bloomberg Television and he offered this pretty bullish advice on the Magnificent Seven. There's a debate as to what really drives when you talk about the U.S. market, especially the S&P 500 or the MAG-7. Um, I'm in the camp that, although I haven't, I don't have the, the facility with math to really try to prove this out, but I'm in the camp that believes that what drives that index are flows. And so at the end of every month, US, U.S. workers, you know, a lot of them, their paychecks go into their 401ks, which are retirement funds, and there's a robo bid for these stocks. And what happens is, you reduce the effective supply of stock because you're taking out the active owners of stocks that will decide, hey, at this price, I'm a seller, at a lower price, I'm a buyer. And you're replacing that with a holder that will never sell unless and until it has outflows because people are drawing down the retirement accounts. So according to that view, as long as the labor market is reasonably strong in the US, which it is, you're not going to see outflows. You're just going to continue to see inflows, especially in those, you know, in the, the most heavily weighted names in the, uh, in the S&P 500. So I have, in the past few years, I have looked back on my career as an activist short seller and, you know, kind of done the math and felt like, well, you know, I probably could have just been levered long the S&P 500, deferred my taxes and, uh, gone through a lot less BS, you know, and, and be in more or less the same position financially. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, that, that does make the market more fragile, but there's a Fed put, there's always a Fed put, you know, is there, does there come a point in time when the system breaks and the Fed can't fix it? Theoretically, yes. In, in our lifetimes, I don't know. Uh, so I think for now, it, probably just pays not to think too much, just close your eyes and buy, um, you know, probably mag seven. Muddy Waters Capital founder Carson Block there. Let's bring in another take. Seema Shah, chief global strategist at Principal Asset Management. Are many that you're talking to feeling you should just close your eyes and buy back mag seven still here? Well, hi, Caroline. I think there is that continued demand certainly for mag seven. And I agree with a lot with what was just said and that the environment is it's almost a sweet spot for U.S. equities. You've got the Fed put, you've got a generally a strong economy. Uh, there's a couple of risks out there, but they're actually more near term risks, something that we wouldn't necessarily expect them to be um, have a sustained impact on the market. So from that perspective, yes, the U.S. still looks really attractive. And the MAG-7, rather than just being a short term play, I think a lot of people, including ourselves, 
And looking at that MAG7 is, is something which is going to deliver not just for this year, but you know, it's more of a strategic asset allocation play that we want to continue to have exposure to those. Having said that, in a positive environment for US equities with rates coming down and growth still fairly solid, you should see a broadening out. I think there's opportunities in other parts of the market which maybe are not as expensive, uh, haven't really seen even some of that catch up trade post COVID. So I think there's opportunities everywhere, but certainly MAG7 does deserve to, to continue to have that, that place in a portfolio. See, McCarson's core idea is that the market, particularly those MAG7 stocks, will be supported because retirement money is kind of on autopilot, right? It just comes in and that supports the index level. How does that impact your job if you're really genuinely interested in, in the technology sector as an investor? So I think he's right in that there is always going to be that play, you know, that, that continued stream into the MAG7. Remember also that the MAG7, because, um, because of that cash levels, because they're considered a bit of a safety defensive play almost, on the US economy and the US market, that it, it's almost some of that, that um, like a continuous stream of where some are considered it's gonna be fairly consistent throughout. And to his point, until it isn't, uh, it will continue to attract flows. So I think that that does come into the thesis. Um, and we have seen that play out over the last couple of years when things get a little bit tough, uh, Max 7 almost becomes that safety trade. So I think that still holds. Uh, it's just that there's probably gonna be other opportunities that also retirement investors should probably be considering. Uh, outside of just the bag seven. This week kind of starts earning season in earnest for technology. How important is this quarter of all quarters, especially given that we have now seen the Fed move in reducing rates? So I think, I mean, like every, every quarter is going to be uh, more important than the last in terms of whether it's going to maintain the rally going forward. For, for tech, obviously, everyone is, you know, the eyes on the tech sector are probably increasing with each earnings season because the expectations uh, in consideration of the fact that valuations are quite frothy, that there's always those eyes can say, are they gonna continue to deliver? Can they deliver on those very lofty expectations uh, that investors have? So we do need to see that continued delivery, but actually I still think that, look, let's say we were to get a disappointing quarter where you see a slight pullback in, um, in their performance relative to expectations. It doesn't necessarily sound the death knell, um, it's just probably a bit of a, a kind of um, a recalibration of expectations back to something which is a little bit more realistic. But then as we look at over a couple of quarters and years, I think investors will still believe that MAG7, particularly with the AI narrative, have still mm. got something to deliver. I want to go exactly there, Seema, and we turn to our great control room to bring up what's happening with NVIDIA, with the like of Palo Alto Networks as well. But more broadly, NVIDIA, of course, the AI trade up to a new record high. It's seeing, though, other key cybersecurity names like Palo Alto Networks also on the higher side today and a new record high, too. How important is the NVIDIA, the chip sector, the AI trade to keep on leading these sorts of gains? They are important. I do think they're reducing in importance, though, because of you know this this fairly strong constructive economic backdrop that we have. But we do feel some continued enthusiasm about obviously about Nvidia, and about AI generally, and other sectors, other companies that can continue to benefit from AI. I mean, you just have to look at chips, and just say look at the ones which are re uh, related to AI and the ones which are not AI related, and you can see there's quite a diversification coming through the market. So there's a clear favourite. Uh, with regards to that narrative and investors are focusing on where can AI play a really strong part? There's the first, uh, I guess, the first generation like NVIDIA, but what are the other next companies that could stand to benefit from mm. this uh, this new th theme that, that is playing out in the market? Simon, well, we love talking to you because you can go cross-asset too. And David Coston and the team over at Goldman Sachs go cross-asset again today for us as well. Because on the flip side of what Carson Block is saying, they're saying, actually, look, the S&P 500 cannot keep up the rate of returns that we're used to. In fact, we're only going to get an annualized 3% return in the future, for example, because they're going to go to bonds. We're going to go to other assets. Are you seeing investors wanting to go there out of equities? So certainly from an asset allocation perspective, we do think that this is also the time to have exposure to fixed income. Um, you know, if you want to go safety, then you should be long duration. But to get that pick up in terms of yield, uh, income, kind of play out, play over the the US, the strength of the US economy, then credit is your place to be. So I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, specifically with regards to that three percent um, return going forward, I think that it is true that you're not likely to see the same kind of returns that we've enjoyed for the last 10, 15 years. 
a lot of that narrative was driven by the fact that the Fed had and other central banks around the world had kept rates really, really low, which we're not anticipating going forward. We see rate cuts, but nothing returning to that incredibly easy monetary policy of, of zero balance sheet expansion. So it does mean that the math is a little bit more uh, onerous for equities, but it's still a compelling proposition. It's just that in this environment, there are opportunities across, I think, across all of risk assets. Um, and it makes sense for investors to have that diversification because it actually continues to deliver at this point. Seema Shah, Chief Global Strategist at Principal Asset Management. Thank you very much back here on Bloomberg Technology. Now, coming up, some changes on Disney's board and a pledge that we will get a new CEO in early 2026. More on that shake up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. chairman of Disney's board. Today, the company announced James Gorman will take on the role of chairman in 2025, while also announcing that a new CEO will be revealed in early 2026. Bloomberg's Felix Gillette joins us. And look, James Gorman, former Morgan Stanley CEO, has been leading this succession chase since August. But why is he now taking on the additional responsibility of being chairman of Disney's board overall? Well, I think Disney's been telegraphing this for a while. I mean, Gorman's the new face of the board. He's got a strong track record in terms of succession. Succession is the number one issue in Disney's future. Uh, who's going to replace Bob Iger? He doesn't have the same baggage uh, that his predecessor did in terms of, you know, what went wrong in you know, the previous Disney succession plans. So I think this makes a lot of sense um, in terms of just elevating him and giving them formal role in terms of making this next choice. Mark Parker retires, James Gorman to the helm from a board level. Take us back to the CEO, and who are the names in the running here, internally, and maybe even externally? Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, it's you know the four direct reports to Iger, the head of parks, the head of TV, the head of movies, and the head of ESPN. Uh, and, you know, everyone, the Kremlinologists at Disney, everyone's very eagerly watching all of this, speculating about, you know, who's up, who's down. I think the company's done a pretty good job at this point of keeping its cards close to its vest. If there is a leading candidate at this point, it really hasn't gotten out. Um, and so I don't think this move changes that at all. We're going to have to wait a few weeks until Disney has earnings. But based on post-Netflix, how is Disney doing right now? I mean, Disney's had a good last year. When you think about the recent Emmys, probably the strongest Emmy performance in the company's history on the TV front, you know, winning with Shogun and the Bear. Uh, Inside Out 2 delivered hugely for the company after a bunch of stumbles on the film side. You know, the parks have been a little bit more mixed. And in terms of ESPN's future, still dealing with the transition to direct to consumer. There's a lot of open questions still about the company's future. But you have to say it's been a little bit better, especially on the entertainment side. Bloomberg's Felix Gillette out in New York City. Thank you so much. Cara, what are you looking at? I'm looking at Microsoft. It's actually down today, but it's ramping up its AI rollout, Ed, launching a new set of, guess what, AI tools designed to send emails, manage records, other business-related tasks. For more, we bring in Bloomberg's Brody Ford, who must be getting a little bit sick of AI <laughs> agents, autonomous agents, agent yeah. force. It is competitive. <laughs> Everybody wants to have an agent now, you know? It seemed like for a year and a half, everybody was building a co-pilot, even if they didn't call it that, right? Every software company had a little box on the side that I could, you know, ask, hey, could you draft me this email? Or, you know, what's the six biggest cities in Germany? Um, but I think what a lot of software companies have found is that, you know, users, sometimes it's not natural to go ahead and think about, oh, what should I ask this? Age, ask this co-pilot. And so now a lot of companies are leaning into this agent idea, which is we're going to have, you know, 10 tasks that are pretty easily replaceable by AI, and we're just going to have it run largely by itself and do that in the background. Right. This puts Microsoft in competition with Salesforce. And if you're on X, you will have seen Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff talk a lot recently about Microsoft's AI tools. Just explain how they're in competition, Brody. Yeah, so this is the segment of Microsoft which competes with Salesforce and some other SaaS companies. You know, it's all about 
CRM, supply chain management, things like that. And they both want to have the hat of, we are leading AI in the SaaS field, right? Because most SaaS companies have somewhat struggled to really have a good coherent AI strategy that is currently making money. And so each of them want to kind of lead it forward. Benioff has always, you know, done a good job getting pressed by, you know, throwing shots at competitors. And this is certainly in that tradition. Bloomberg's Brody Ford on all things Microsoft AI agent. Thank you very much. Now, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, details on Russia's major hack on the nation of Georgia ahead of that country's upcoming elections. Important reporting coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, it's time for Talking Tech. And first up, Process says its e-commerce division is expected to surge more than 950% this fiscal year. Adjusted earnings before interest and taxes will be $400 million in the 12 months ending in March. The company's new CEO, Fabrizio Bulisi, made the announcement earlier today and will join Bloomberg's London Tech Summit tomorrow. Plus, Lumen Technologies and Meta have announced a partnership in support of Meta's AI ambitions. The agreement will provide dedicated interconnection for Meta's infrastructure that the company says will be crucial for future AI development. And Russia has been operating a multi-year hacking campaign targeting the nation of Georgia. That's according to documents and technical reports seen by Bloomberg News. The comprehensive espionage attack focused on Georgia's foreign ministry, finance ministry, central bank, and key energy and telecommunications providers. And Carrie, let's get a lot more on that story. Such a significant report. We go to Bloomberg's Alberto Nadali, who really was leading the charge here along with colleagues. Alberto, just how, how is Russia managing to hack on such a significant degree? Well, I think the thing to want to understand about Russia in, in, in terms of countries like uh, Georgia is that it targets them with uh, disinformation and then it puts great efforts into um, these hacks and uh, looking for vulnerabilities within critical infrastructure, looking for vulnerabilities within government uh, ministries and spends a lot of time uh, doing that. And that allows them eventually to um, enter these uh, systems undetected and for years to gather information and very seriously and worryingly here put them in a position also to commit potential acts of sabotage. The headline is severe, right? Russia targeting a nation state with, with these hacks. But how serious were they, Alberto, and what was their impact? I think the, the key point is the severity of these hacks, because we're not talking about things like, you know, denials of service that take a website down for, for a couple of hours. There were two main aspects uh, to this operation. The first was gathering intelligence. So they were able to gather information such as the emails of um, government officials, the emails of employees working in uh, key companies, but also they were able to put themselves in, in a position that had they wanted to and had the need arisen, let's say, they would have been able to sabotage key bits of the country's critical infrastructure, such as parts of the energy grid, telecommunications, or railways, oil terminals, and things like that. And that's Alberto, the severity your reporting, is very severe. In your reporting, did you get a sense of what Russia's goal was here, what its motivation in doing this was? So on the one hand, it's gathering information. So for example, if you look specifically at the hack of the foreign ministry, they were targeting and gathering information about uh, key Georgian embassies in places like the European Union, um, countries in the Baltics. So countries that and areas that Russia has a, an interest in and is, and is looking at. And the second uh, uh, strategic objective, let's call it, uh, is to put itself in a position that if politics in the country, if Georgia goes in a direction that Russia does not like, it then has the ability to take things a step further and commit these acts of uh, uh, sabotage, such as targeting 
electricity grids or tele telecommunications uh, systems. And it's a pattern, for example, we've seen elsewhere. Uh, they've done similar in the past in Ukraine. Alberto, this was this was deep reporting, right? This was investigation through documents. But did, did Russia, through any official channels, have anything to say, any comment about the reports? Um, usually what happens is we ask for comment and they never reply. Uh, right. And then after a while, you will see in a press conference or in a statement, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or some other government department will refer to stories in Western media. And so that's where we might expect there to be a reaction in the coming days. And equally, this is contemporaneous, right? The elections in Georgia are, are this week, I believe. So, you know, we talked about the severity and the impact, but will this nation be able to proceed, you know, with its uh, democratic process kind of free of any interference in that sense? Um, I think the elections obviously will take place. Um, what tends to happen if, if you look, for example, at the elections that took place this weekend in uh, nearby in, in Moldova, there were reports of uh, Russia paying people uh, to vote in a certain way, intense campaigns of, of disinformation. And so you will have a similar environment in which these elections um, take place. And then depending on the results of the votes, you'll see what happens next. This was a reporting you did with, with our colleague Ryan Gallagher. You know, without giving it away, what happens next? Where does your reporting take you? Um, we report a lot. We keep reporting on what Russia does in the world in, in, in terms of these so-called hybrid campaigns or so their use of uh, disinformation and hacking and you know, non-military um, methods to try and achieve its uh, goals. And in, you know, in the case of Ukraine, obviously, military uh, methods. And so we're staying on this uh, beat because obviously Georgia is not the only country that Russia is targeting. Alberto Nardelli, we thank you. Extraordinary reporting. Go read it. Meanwhile, coming up, we talk to Taiwan's premier on the future of the country's semiconductor business. So much to be digging into. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in London. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Bring us some markets, Caro. Yeah, because they're under pressure from a macro perspective, but there are some single names you want to shine a light on that are doing rather well. We're off by some six tenths of percent on the Nasdaq 100, actually coming to session lows at the moment. We are worried about big earnings on deck. We've got Tesla, for example, later this week. We're also anticipating a very close election in the United States. What does that mean for the future of big tech, antitrust and crypto? Move on and have a look at some of the individual names as the market kind of waits and watches. Disney under pressure, even as they announce, look, new chairman of the board, not completely unsurprisingly, James Gorman comes to the helm starting in 2025 and promises a new CEO will be delivered by the start of, or at least early on in 2026. Palo Alto Networks, and a new record high, only just, look, we're clinging on to gains, but it is at a record. NVIDIA 2, 1.7% higher. Interesting that the week after this, we get most of its customers giving us earnings. Think Alphabet, think Microsoft, think Meta. What will that say for the ongoing demand for its chipset? OK, sticking with semiconductors, Taiwan's economy has seen massive growth, thanks in part to chip manufacturing. Still, Premier Cho jong tai says the country can't just solely rely on its high-tech industries. He sat down with Bloomberg Editor-in-Chief Emeritus Matt Winkler. Check this out. Taiwan's economic resiliency comes from the partnership we have with friendly countries. Domestically, we have a strong, vertically integrated supply chain. This is why we believe Taiwan can play a crucial role in the democratic supply chain. We are heavily reliant on high-tech industries, especially in the rapidly developing semiconductor sector. 
However, for Taiwan's economy to achieve comprehensive growth, we cannot rely solely on high-tech industries. That's why we proposed a dual-axis transformation for small and medium-sized enterprises. We aim to help our traditional industries and small to medium-sized enterprises enter the AI era. We will use government resources to assist them in adopting AI applications and integrating with this industry, allowing Taiwan's economy to grow comprehensively. So, Mr. Premier, the U.S. is going to have an election, a presidential election. Uh, it's just weeks away. Uh, former President Trump previously uh, said that Taiwan took chip business from uh, the U.S. and asked Taiwan to pay protection fees. And do you think Taiwan should continue to allow semiconductor manufacturers to, like TSMC, to build factories overseas? Taiwan also needs to rely on advanced countries for new technologies in materials and equipment. I often say that the government has a responsibility to Taiwan's industries, and Taiwan has a responsibility to the world. Mr. Trump also said Taiwan should increase military spending to 10 percent of gross domestic product. And I wonder if that's possible uh, in your view. Taiwan has a very large neighbor with significant ambitions toward it. So Taiwan must take responsibility for safeguarding our sovereignty and national security. In next year's central government budget, we have allocated more than 640 billion Taiwan dollars for defense. This will bring our defense spending to approximately 2.4 to 2.6 percent of GDP. While we cannot allocate 10 percent of GDP to defense in one go, we have increased the budget compared to the past. We also hope that through Taiwan's efforts, the world will recognize Taiwan's determination and provide greater support. What we're maintaining is not only Taiwan's security, but also the peace and stability of the entire Indo-Pacific region. You mentioned uh artificial intelligence earlier in this discussion and given the importance of AI and how fast it is expanding um, there is a debate about electricity supply and I'm just wondering uh, do you think sort of new nuclear power technology is something an option say for Taiwan that you could consider we know that many other countries are actively developing various forms of nuclear energy. Currently, we expect that Taiwan will have no issues with power supply for industries before 2030. Our nuclear power plants are being decommissioned and operations are stopping. This is because we need to prepare for future nuclear technology developments and to respond to any potential legal changes in Taiwan. When we take the next step forward and reconsider the existing nuclear power plants, we will need sufficient manpower. So even though our plants are being decommissioned, the personnel must not be dispersed. They must remain to address new technologies or solve current issues. That was Taiwan Premier Cho Jung Tai. Caro. Meanwhile, in Pennsylvania, Ed, Governor Josh Shapiro expressed concern over Elon Musk's plan to give money to voters, suggesting law enforcement reviews. This follows Musk's announcement to donate $1 million daily to a random registered voter supporting his super PAC's petition on free speech and gun rights. Just take a listen to this from NBC's Meet the Press. I think it's something that law enforcement can take a look at. I'm not okay. the attorney general anymore of Pennsylvania. I'm the governor. Uh, but it does raise some serious questions. Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner joins us now, who covers all things Elon, but covers all things X as well. And just how does this dovetail into what you're seeing on his social media platform right now? Yeah, I mean, he's using X as a very pro-Trump megaphone right now. I actually opened the app just yesterday and on my For You feed, right, which is the feed that's supposed to be tailored uh, recommendations for you. Eleven of the first 15 posts that I saw were from Elon himself, and all of them were, you know, supporting Trump, pushing uh, Trump's uh, Republican or conservative agenda. I mean, he's very much taken this this social network and feels to me like he's using it to really hammer home his own personal politics in this fight to, uh, you know, help Trump win the election in a couple weeks. The activity is notable. I, I would also point out Vice President Harris has two accounts on X, right? Her 
uh, official vice presidential account and then her, I guess we would call it personal campaign account. And she also posts daily and regularly, and that appears in my timeline, maybe not as much as, as, as Musk's posts appear. But I guess the point that we would, we would point, make is that it's the, it's the content and the commentary. It's very similar to what one might find on Truth Social, Kurt. Yeah, I, I kind of jokingly called X Truth Social 2.0 uh, a few weeks ago in a newsletter that I wrote because it feels very much uh, like you are seeing President Trump's message hammered home repeatedly, you know, either through Elon, through Trump himself, through other uh, supporters. You're right, Ed. I, I also have seen a lot of posts from Kamala Harris and others. It feels like my feed is is almost 100 percent U.S. politics focused right now. It's interesting because back in, you know, Twitter 1.0 days, they used to say, well, this is obviously an important news cycle. It's an important thing for the service, but it's not the only thing, right? You would still see uh, a basketball, baseball, sports. You would see culture, music, things like that. It feels to me like they've dialed up the algorithm to, to really make the election front and center for every user. Um, and, and I'm certainly noticing it every time I open the app these days. Does that matter long term for Grok, for example? It's... AI chatbot, and indeed more broadly, what we end up wanting our social media platforms for. Yeah, it's been interesting to see X's approach here to the election compared to, say, Meta and what they're doing with Instagram um, and Facebook, right? So on the Meta side, they're basically saying, hey, we're trying to, we're, we're leaning away from the election. If you're talking about the election, we're not going to recommend that post to people outside of your network, whereas X is doing the exact opposite. And it's just going to be interesting to see long term, you know, does this burn people out or is this what people want? Do they want to, to go and see election 24-7 information, in which case maybe X is making the right choice? Choice, or is Meta right? Is Mark Zuckerberg right? Right? That, that, that people don't want this stuff thrown in their face 24/7, 365. So we'll we'll kind of see. I think you know, for me personally, it, it feels a little overkill. It feels a little bit like burnout to me over on X. Um, but you know, that's the decision Elon has made. And, and again, interesting comparison this election cycle to have a Meta and Mark Zuckerberg going in a very different direction in terms of how much they want to prioritize election content, particularly after the election too. Kurt Wagner, we thank you so much on that key story. Meanwhile, coming up, Talking VC, Zip co-founder Rahul Zapati joins us next in our VC spotlight as the AI-focused business raises money. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, AI-powered procurement software startup Zip is changing the way companies obtain the supplies they need to operate and recently announced its latest round, $190 million Series D in funding. Here with more Zip co-founder and CEO Rajul Zapade. Uh, welcome to the program. Actually, the backstory is really interesting and it's worth getting right to it. You used to work at Airbnb and you had a specific job and you were basically like, this isn't working. Uh, so you went with some friends and colleagues and designed something better and were like, you know what, let's just start a company that does this. That's pretty fair, right? No, that's absolutely fair. So my co-founder Lou and I were both engineering and, and product leaders at, at Airbnb and we had to go through this confusing procurement process of if we need to buy something in the business, what are all the approvals that are required, right, between budget and legal and IT and security and all the different teams. and. And that's what we solved. Uh, we started Zip to solve for by providing one front door for any employee in the business to request a purchase. I'm really interested that you're AI powered. What form is this generative AI, more broad AI? Because you're serving open AI, for example. So you built upon their large language model. How does that all go? What are you building that they can't internally for their own process procurement? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. It's absolutely generative AI. And if you think about the procurement process as a whole, right, we have access to so much relatively unstructured data, right? When when employees at organizations are buying things, there are millions of contracts, invoices, order forms, so much data uh, that's available. And we can take AI and actually apply it in a really, really practical way, which is what we do for our enterprise customers today to do everything from helping parse invoices, 
to reading MSAs and contracts for risks and the like. You're with the money, hiring engineering talent, R&D talent. You're setting up an AI lab. And I go back to really what is underlying all of this. Are you building your own large language models to be able to do this? Are you looking to develop that more with these tools that you want to build in the AI lab? That's a great question. So we, we absolutely are, are using uh, uh, these funds to invest and create an AI lab uh, and, uh, and, and really double click on, if you, if, you know, like I sort of said, like the data that we have access to as part of procurement uh, and, and really thinking about how do we best apply it in a practical way. Uh, and so there's, there's more that we'll have to, to share there in the coming months. And so which LLM are you using? Uh, so we today uh, largely use the OpenAI models. I broke my own rule, which is I, I always start on what's newest and fresh, but I wanted the backstory because it was probably two years ago that you and I first met. So in that time, you've raised a lot of money. You have a decent valuation, more than $2 billion. But have you built a business in that time? Have you managed to take this product and technology and actually sell it to other businesses and enterprises who in turn are using it themselves? Yeah, of course. We've been really privileged to work with some of the largest enterprises in the world, companies like Discover Financial, Snowflake, Prudential, Coinbase, and many others. And even as an example, Discover Financial has saved over you know, 3,000 different business approvals that they've realized they don't need anymore. Or Snowflake has over $305 million of Zip-supported savings logged. Uh, what we find is that procurement is actually the second largest area of spend for any business in the world after payroll. Uh, right? It's trillions of dollars uh, in the world that you know, employees of companies are buying you know, for office supplies, software, and, and, and the like. And so there's so much opportunity. And for you yourselves, building on top of OpenAI, what's that been like? You know, in the news cycle, it's pretty chaotic when it comes to open AI, but as a customer or partner, what was it like for you? I'd have to say it's been, it's been great. And the feedback that we've, we've received from customers uh, has been really positive. As an example, Coinbase has saved thousands and thousands of hours uh, with Zip processing, you know, hundreds of thousands of invoices uh, in a much more automated way. Zip co-founder and CEO, Rajul Zabade, thanks for coming on here. Congrats on the round. Meanwhile, coming up, details on another one. In VC, Perplexity's major new funding round is taking shape and plans to take on Google. This is Bloomberg Technology. Perplexity, the AI company trying to build a search product that rivals Google's in early talks to raise funding from investors at a valuation of roughly $9 billion. That's according to a Bloomberg source. Bloomberg's Shireen Ghaffari broke the news and joins us with the latest. So what do we know about the round? This is a name that's coming up a lot at the moment, Shireen. That's right. I think it, you know, is a reflection of how much there is interest in continuing to invest in this AI wave, this AI bubble, right? We've seen OpenAI recently close a mega round. And now I think there seems to be continued interest in getting in on that. Perplexity is very popular with people who are looking to use AI for search. Let's just talk about the moat that it's built, or if there is indeed a moat, because many have felt that this is clear competitive threat to Google, but Google can equally perhaps take it on itself. That's right. I mean, Perplexity really had the head start in using the most cutting edge AI to kind of make a standalone app where you can, instead of Googling something, you can search for it and get all your research and all your answers right there and kind of uh, one neat product. So I think they had a head start with that. I think, of course, Google is also increasingly integrating um, AI into their answers. But I've talked to a lot of folks who are starting to even stop using Google and use Perplexity. So I will say it's very popular with certain kind of um, early adopters, I would say, in AI. Uh, and I think that's reflected in this investor interest. So Perplexity want to raise $500 million, according to our reporting. But the valuation is a pretty big jump from where it, it last raised money. Do we know who wants to get in on this? You know, I have in the back of my mind that OpenAI doesn't want its investors looking elsewhere. 
Right. I think we're still reporting that out. But um, one thing I will say is that perplexity has been increasingly trying to get into sort of enterprise search, um, things like financial search, uh, you know, searching through customer data. Um, so I think that's going to be an increasing focus and potentially something that investors are looking at. Bloomberg, Shireen Ghaffari, another great piece of reporting. Thanks so much. Cara, what you got? I'm going to turn our attention to Apple now because its new iPad that's designed specifically with AI in mind is being broken down by Mark Gurman, who has more. It was power on this weekend, very well read throughout. Just tell us what's new when it comes to the, the iPad. Yeah, so earlier last week, Apple announced a new iPad mini. It's the first update to that product in about three years. And this iPad mini doesn't have a lot of new functionality, but what they did is they upped the memory and they upped the processor to match last year's iPhone. And why is that important? Because that allows it to support Apple intelligence. Now, as we talked about a few times now, Apple intelligence, at least the first few iterations, not that impressive, right? You're missing some of the more whiz-bang features like generative AI created emojis, but you do get things like notification summaries. Now, this is yes. launching next week. I don't find the AI features that impressive, but Apple does have a secret advantage. Once the AI starts working well, once they either build or acquire or pay their way into successful AI features, this new iPad mini shows the company's ability to rapidly add support for new features across this ecosystem in a way that really isn't matched by Google, Samsung, or any other provider. So while it's a small update, it's indicative of the larger overall ability that the company has to bring features down the line uh, very quickly. And it makes the iPad mini's price point interesting because, you know, from a processor standpoint, it's the same as this, right? iPhone 15 Pro, they both have A17 and they're kind of double dipping a little bit. I mean, you just talked about that secret strategy or secret advantage. Go a little bit further on that, Mark. Yeah, um, well, this processor is the same processor as last year. It's a chip they, they no longer make other than for this product, right? And so... They had a lot of leftover components from production of the iPhone 15 Pro. There's a process called binning, uh, which essentially means processors uh, that lose some of their components during the production process, right? So the 15 Pro version of the A17 chip has six CPU cores. Those are the main processing cores in the chip. Uh, the ones in this new iPad mini have five processing cores, which essentially means these have been binned or they've lost the core during production. So I'm not saying these are the the, the bad ones that they threw away, uh, but what I am saying, it's about a little bit of a stripped down version of last year's processor, yes. something that's been recycled here. And from an operational standpoint, it's a big win for Apple, especially for margins. So on a new iPad mini. Am I going to be able to design my latest Nikes? Briefly, Mark, you've been writing about Tim Cook's other key role right now. Well, the, do, the new iPad mini does support the new Apple Pencil Pro. I, sh I should add that, right? But the previous ones did support older Apple Pencils, and you certainly could draw your Nikes there. I thought this story was interesting because I think a lot of people don't realize that Tim Cook has a bit of a side gig, and that's being the lead independent director of Nike. Nike has been going through a tumultuous period, and obviously as a board member, Tim Cook has been helping out. Uh, right. He helped bring on their new CEO, Elliot Hill. That hire has all the hallmarks of a Tim Cook hire. And so we'll see what happens to Nike over the next six months with the new leadership. Mark Gurman, you're busy as always. We appreciate it. Now that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Absolutely jam-packed. Recap on the pod. You know where to find the pod online on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and of course on the Bloomberg platforms from London and San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology.